Welcome to the Askeville Assembly of God Sermon Podcast. We're so glad you've taken the time to listen, and we pray this message from our pastors will be a blessing on your life this week. You'll open to Luke chapter 19. We're going back to Luke chapter 19 this week. Last week we talked about being on mission. This week I want to talk to you about our mission, our mission together. Last week we talked about the story of Zacchaeus and how Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Luke chapter 19 verse 10 says that our Savior came to seek and save the lost. Now I want to talk to you about what we're here to do. And by the way, if Jesus is your master, if Jesus is your king, if Jesus is your Lord, then you are here to seek and save the lost as well. He has given us the same mission he came to do. And so today we're going to be talking about the story of the ten minas. The ten minas is a story that closely parallels... The, the talents of Matthew. The book of Matthew talks about the talents. We know that story. A master was going off on a trip and he left one one of his, his people. He left him five talents. He left another one two talents. He left another one talent. I preached the snot out of those that sermon a bunch of times because I like that one better because I like to point out that God blesses some people with five talents and he blesses some people with only one. I haven't met many of those ones, but I know I'm a two. And I have spent a lot of my life being very insecure by the five talented people. I like teaching that one because it talks about the the incongruency of life and how things are not always exactly easy and life is not always fair and it's not always, it don't always justify itself out, it's not perfect and I like that one, but the story we're going to go to today is close to that, but it's actually a little bit different. The, The story of the ten minas... It's actually a story where he talks about that he's given us all the same thing and expects from all of us fruit. It's a more convicting story to me because I like the idea that I didn't have as much as someone else to offer, but it's hard for me. I'm I'm scared of the thought that one day I'm going to have to stand before him and he's going to say, I gave you the same life I gave Billy Graham. What did you do with it? I gave you the same life. I gave R.O. Denton, what did you do with it? I gave you the same life. I could, I could list 500 people that I know that their crowns are going to be bigger than mine. And you know what he's not? He's not looking for results. He's looking for faithfulness. And I'm going to prove that to you in just a second. There's six different times in the New Testament that the phrase, well done, well done, finished, and finished well, is mentioned. Two of them are in Matthew 25 when it was talking about the parable of the talents. One of them is during the story we're going to read today in Luke chapter 19. Another one is in Acts chapter 15 when Paul is writing a letter to all the churches who have been uh, contaminated by the Jewish beliefs of, of circumcision and that kind of thing. He writes to them, he said, you would do well to abstain from meat offered to idols And sexual immorality. You would do well. It would be good for you. It would help you out. It would be a blessing for you and your testimony to stay away from these two things. Everything else, follow the Lord. Okay? Acts chapter 15. It's the same phrasing. Done well. I I don't know about you, but when I say before the Lord, I want to hear well done, right? The the fifth time that phrase is used is in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 when it says, Children... It will go well with you if you'll obey your parents. It's the same word he uses there. It will go well with you. Children, if there's any more in the room, if you'll listen to your parents, I promise you it will go well with you. It will. My dad taught me, I don't know how true this is, but he said to me, the reason that scripture says what it does about you'll have long life on the earth is the only it's the only commandment with the promise. He said, the reason is, if you ever disobey me, I'll kill you. Which must make him a a liar because I'm here, you know. I mean, I'm not, not, he didn't mean to be. He was, you know, anyway, all right. There's one more time it mentions it, and it's in the book of Mark. And Jesus says, you'll always have the poor to do well to but you'll only have me for a short time. That's a paraphrase. But he says, you'll always have the poor. 
You can always do well by the poor because they'll always be here, but I'm only here for a short amount of time. Here's what I want, the reason I wanted to mention, mention one of, each one of these is because for me, when I stand before God, and I believe with all my heart every single one of us will, when I stand before God, I want to hear somewhere in the discourse, well done, faithful servant. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Verse 11. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. One of the biggest themes in all of Jesus' parables is the return. If you believe in his resurrection, you best believe in his return. Because he talked about that more than he talked about his resurrection. He is coming back. He is coming back. And when he does, he will come to settle up the debts. And if it's not true, then none of it's true. So he's coming back. He said, calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas, which minas is just a, it's a group of money, okay? It's, a, it's, a, it's how they collected money. Uh, my, my Bible told me it's about three to four months of salary. So depending on how well off you are in here, put the number in there, okay? I looked at the demographics of Bertie County, and it would be in the ballpark demographically, whatever, the norm here in Bertie County, it would be in the in the grouping of about nine to fifteen thousand dollars. Okay? Now a talent is a whole year. I'm sorry, a talent is like a whole lifetime of salary. But a mina is only about three or four months. Calling ten of his servants, he gave ten minas and said to them, Engage in business until I come. Be busy. Go do the work. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us when he returned. We saw this week in England, long live the king. I just want you to know that a king doesn't ask his people, How am I doing? A king doesn't ask his people, Is it okay for me to be your king? Can I come back and be your king? I don't care what delegation that humanity brings together to state that God isn't real or that we don't want him. He is still God on the throne. He is not asking our opinion. He's not taking a vote. There's not a delegation that can change his mind. He is coming back no matter who or what says about him. He is coming back. The king is coming. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered those servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, good and faithful servant, because you have been faithful in a little, you shall have the authority over ten cities. Now, just so you understand, a mina is about three months. Ten minas might buy you a, a really nice house. But the reward of making one mina ten minas was not a really nice house. It was ten cities to be in control of. We don't understand. When we sow into the kingdom, we never see the grandiose, long-distance, big reward that comes from investing in that kingdom. We can see the short reward. We got a dozen app on our phone to let us know every one of our investments in Wall Street will pop up and ping, let us know how much we're making throughout the day. But in the kingdom of God, we cannot see the investment where it's going to lead to. We don't know how many destinies have been changed because we were willing to serve, because we were willing to live, love. We don't know how many generations now have hope because we were willing to go and be willing to send. We don't know what has changed in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of the heart, because... We can't see it, but God sees it. He knows what we have done. And when we are responsible with the little he gives us, and by the way, the little is your life. 
and the gospel. What can you do with the life and the gospel that he has given every single one of us? If we can turn one life and one saved soul into ten, then he'll entrust us. He will have entrusted to us ten cities. Again, in the spiritual realm, you can't bank, you can't, you can't cash that out, okay? But I got to tell you, I can't wait to get to heaven and stand before the Lord. And as the devil accuses me of all the things I've done, God looks down and says, uh, I don't see any of that in here. Everything I see is covered by the blood of my son. But let me bring out a couple other people right quick. Uh, do, you, do you remember this young man, Webb? Yeah, I, yeah. Talk, talk to him one time about Jesus. Yeah, he accepted the Lord that day and he, he gained hope. And uh, I just want you to real quick, I want you to see all the people that he led to Jesus that are in heaven today because of your investment on that day. Do you remember this young lady? Yeah, I, I, when I was in on a missions trip, I, I, I met her. Yeah, exactly. Uh, she ended up serving the people in her community for the rest of her life because of that one encounter. And I, I don't want it attributed to my name, okay? There's no, there's no pride here. What I'm saying is, The little investments we make in our life, because it's the kingdom of the heart, we can honestly be given cities because we're willing to serve the people around us. But when we hold these treasures in our heart, we no longer bless others with them. We clog up the kingdom of heaven. You've been granted faith, hope, and love to change the world. Let me finish reading. The second came saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, and you are to be over five cities. uh, Then another came saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and you reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not own, I'm sorry, did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank and at the coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he already has ten minas. This is happening in church culture right now. Where a few churches are doing everything they can to reach the lost. And people in churches who are not actively trying to reach the lost. They want to be where something's happening. And they'll leave to join the ones who are on mission. And all the ones left behind are angry. Why would you leave us to go to them when they've got all they need? And the answer to that is because they're doing the mission of Jesus. I want to be where the mission of Jesus is being done. Where the lost are being found. Where hope is being shown to the hopeless. I want to be right where people know to go when they need something the most. That's attractive to followers of Jesus. They said he already had ten minas. He says, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. For from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Well, us in our American view, we don't think that's very nice, is it? Take it away from the one who don't have much. That's not very nice. Yet God's a smart businessman. Why would he invest in people who aren't faithful with what he gave them? Why would he keep his investments in places where the people who had given it to haven't been faithful with the good news? How many of you want children who love the Lord? Are you doing the things to bring that hunger in their heart? Are you faithful? But as for those enemies of mine who did not want to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. There were ten servants. Each one was given a mina. 
One came back with ten more, the other one came back with five more, and the rest of them were slaughtered. Father, I pray over the next few moments I would preach and teach this this uh, portion of Scripture, God, so that we could understand what it is you have to say to us today. God, I pray that by the end of the day we would recognize, number one, you have chosen us. Number two, we have a great destiny. And number three, Lord, you want us to spread this word all over the world. And we thank you so much for your many blessings to us. I thank you for this church. I thank you for these people. And I thank you for the word that you've given me today. Lord, I pray that I would speak it with clarity. In your mighty name, amen and amen. I remember growing up around here, and I, I'm not, I mean, I may put off an air these days of being pretty confident, but I did not grow up very confident. Uh, in fact, there was always somebody I could compare myself to and, and not be good enough. I'll never forget one of the most, one of the things that I'm half decent at that I've always loved is I love to sing. I like to sing, and I love, I love to just belt and just let it rip. I just enjoy it, okay? And uh, I remember when I was probably 11 years old, Kevin Stewart came and did a youth revival one time. I was probably about 12, somewhere in there, 11 to 13. And he did a youth revival, and he sang that song, um, When the Music Fades. And he sang it right down here among us. He went on stage. And y'all know Kevin. He's got a little blues in him. You know, he's swaying with it. And, man, I just remember being transfixed on that gift. And I thought to myself, if I could do that the rest of my life, I would be fully pleased. And I so enjoyed his ministry in that. Because at the time, he was young, right? I mean, You know, I grew up under Brother Denton Sr., and then Pastor Buddy, who was young-ish, but Kevin was really actually young, you know? And I just remember thinking, like, if I could just do that, I feel like I'd be very pleased. And I remember during our theaters, our, our dramas, our um, Easter dramas, I'd come in here and I'd sing, and I, I started liking to do, like, impressions and stuff like that. And my favorite singer in all the earth is Doug Baysmore. I, I don't think there's a person on earth I'd rather listen. Garth Brooks is second to Doug, okay? All right? Just second, though, all right? And I remember I'd, I'd watch Doug, and I would mimic him, and I would have his little... He had this thing, but he had some tender songs in that drama, and I would even try to get my voice to crack in the same place he did. And I remember telling somebody, I said, I really think I've got Doug down. And they're like, you cannot sing like Doug, this friend of mine. You know, I have miserable friends like Job. Um, and they said, you cannot. And I remember um, I, I belted it out. I sang the whole song right in front of him just to prove it. And I hit every note, and I sounded, I mimicked him perfectly. And they went, wow, why don't you always sing like that instead? Brother Randy, that was over 20 years ago. And that pings up here from time to time. It'll ping up here and just, why won't you just be like somebody else? Oh, here's somebody talk about a preacher. They don't mean nothing by it. It's okay for you to like other preachers. All right? I know who's the best. But sometimes I'll hear, I just, I'll hear somebody say, oh, I just miss preaching like that. And I, oh. Oh, you do? Okay, fine. Now, now that, ain't, that ain't your burden. That's my burden, okay? But can anybody in the room, can anybody in this room feel what I'm, do you connect at all with what I'm talking about? Do you ever, ever look at somebody else and think, man. I wish I could be a little bit more like that. Did, did anybody ever tell you that? I wish you were more like your sibling. I wish you were more like him, her, it. <laughs> I catch myself sometimes when I'm real low in my confidence. Amanda can't even mention what other people on earth are doing. Look at Gretchen. Isn't she having fun at Disney World? I'll never afford to take you to Disney World. I'm sorry. She don't even want to go to Disney. We don't care about the mouse. But I've dealt with insecurity so much in my life. I mean, and the thing is, I, I found a way to kind of put this shield out in front, and I try my best to seem like i am always got this feeling, but there are times still where just a comment will make it past the shield, and I'm, I'm crushed. 
And then all I can see is that I'll never attain to what somebody else has. I'll never have what somebody else can do. I'll never do what somebody else can be. And I, and I sit down and I just want to get down and say, Lord, why, why am I only a two-talent person? And I guess I could be worse, you know. I guess I could be a one-talent, but my goodness, why am I only a two-talent? But here's what the Lord says to me. Uh, the same blood that was poured out for the five-talent is the same blood that was poured out for you, son. I have forgiven you for just as much, and I expect from you just as much as I do from the five-talent. How much more of a testimony is it that he would be willing to come and get little old me with just two talents? How much more that he would entrust to me the same salvation that he entrusted to Billy Graham? Billy Graham obviously is more responsible than me, but why would he come to find me? Why would he come look for me when I had nothing to offer? No talent, no gifts, nothing to give whatsoever. Why would he come to find me? Why would he search me out like he did Zacchaeus? Why would he come to my tree, look up and say, I'm going to your house, I'm bringing your salvation today why would he do that because he believes in me but my job is now to believe in him enough to tell the world about him that's what i've been responsible for and it doesn't matter how good i am at it it doesn't matter how many people follow me it matters how much i am about the business of my father i gotta take the one mind that he gave me the one life he gave me the one lord the one gospel the one spirit the one thing he's given me and i've got to do as much as i can in the business of my father with it because I don't have just a little bit of time and he's going to come back and when he comes back but will I be able to offer back to him what he's given me or will I say oh God I hid it so that you could have it right back and will I stand there on that day and him say oh just one here Trey have another one (laughs) I only have this one mina Randy you've got one mina We only have one minor. Everybody has been given the same thing. How are you going to use it? Where are you going to invest it in His kingdom? Whose heart are you moving upon to bring them closer to faith, hope, and love? There is a fire. What are you doing to bring it? Well, let me just tell you a few things. Did you hear what the servant said? There was a group of the servants that the delegation got together and said, let's go let him know we don't want him to be our king. And he don't care. He didn't ask you, could he be king? He is a conquering king. He is a strong and mighty warrior. And he's not asking anybody opinions on whether or not he is king. He will save those he wants to save. He will love those who he loves. And he will bless those he wants to bless. He doesn't have to ask anybody for why he's doing what he's doing. That's why they sent a delegation and the next verse says he came back. Later on, he gives the one minor to the guy who made ten, and they say, well, what about him? He's already got ten. And what did the king say? None your business. Not your money. Not to mention the fact he'd just been given ten cities. Now, here's what I want you to know about that. If you do a good job, this is something very important. I need everybody to hear this. If you do a good job, the reward of a good job is more work. Okay? That's why some of y'all are bitter at your job right now. The better I do at my job, it seems like the more work. Exactly. Because the more they can entrust you with work, the more work you're going to get. That's, so, that's why some of y'all are wore out, but that's also why you produce so much. So you want less work? Do a worse job. And this principle isn't only in the, in the physical, it's also in the spiritual. Why would God bless you? Oh, oh wow. Why would God bless this church with the spiritual gifts, the spiritual blessings He wants to give if we're going to hoard them all for ourselves and enjoy them in the altar and that's all they go to? Why in the world would He invest in this field if we're not going to take the harvest to the ones who need it most? There are people starving all around all around us. And we gorge our we just gorge ourselves every single Sunday. We love it so much. I don't want to be a part of a church or a church movement where it's about me. I want to be doing what Jesus was doing. I want to go here and there seeking to save those who were lost. Because that's what his mission was. Now, I'm thankful. I'm thankful, I'm thankful, I'm thankful that I'm a part of a church who's been richly blessed by God. But i got to tell you, if we put all those in the bank, 
And we just hope to live off of the interest of the beautiful gifts of the past. But we don't invest it in another generation. I hope the king doesn't bless that. Because that's not good management. I want to be faithful with what he's given me. I do know this too. If you're not faithful with what he's given you, he'll take it away from you. And you'll see somebody you don't even like get more. Are you faithful? Faithful in what, Webb? Well, I've talked about this a bunch of times, but there's really four things that tell you, tell me everything I need to know about you. If you want to know where your heart is, let's take a little heart checkup. Number one, who is your master? Who do you listen to more than anybody else? Do you take your cues from other people? Do you take your cues from your spouse, your, your children? One of the plagues on parenting today is that we let our children run our homes. And then we wonder why our homes are all kilter because your kids are not equipped to run the home. We want so bad to be liked by our children that we're not willing to lead them. Who's your master? Who's leading your life? Who do you follow? Whose commands are you trying to do everything he's called you to do? Are you living out of the overflow of who God has called you to be? Who is your Lord? Who is your God? Are you going where Jesus has called you to do? Are you doing the mission he's called you to do? Are you being faithful to the one that matters most? I can look at who who your master is and I can tell a lot about who you are. The second thing I can look at is who you hang around. Who are your friends? You show me your friends, and I can show you your future. You show me your friends, I can show you your future. What kind of people do you hang around? What what kind of people are you comfortable being around? Speaking of the first one, A.W. Tozer once said, Nothing twists or deforms the soul more than a low or unworthy conception of God. Nothing twists or deforms the soul like a low or unworthy conception of God. Many of us in this room, we spend our days scared of God. And it's because we expect only good and not evil also. But if we'll let God be God and know that He's good, by the way, that scripture comes from Job. If we'll believe that He is good and that He's working all things out for the good of those who are called in according to His will, then even when things don't go our way, we have to continue believing that He's good and He's working all things out for the good of those who are called according to His purpose. And even when we get that report we don't like or that person hurts our feelings or we get set back or we just woke up on the wrong side of the bed today, And as I was walking out of the house, my shirt caught the doorknob and I ripped my shirt and I'm really mad about that. And where's God in this moment? Let me not be insane enough to ask the Lord why he would curse me. I should like walk, walk not so close to the doorknob, right? Anyway, when I'm convinced that the Lord is trying to get on my case, I don't believe in his goodness, but that's what I need to do the most. In fact, it says here that the ones who believed that he was wicked or that he was not a good leader, those are the ones he slaughtered. So let me just tell you, not only is he actually good, and he is, but you don't get it out just because you don't feel like he's good. He's not going to be like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't realize you would take it that way. All right. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Solomon said, Proverbs 13, 20, he said, if you'll hang out with the wise, you'll be wise. The same goes for fools. The secret to being faithful to God is in friendships. The secret to being faithful to God is in friendships. It may not be the most important, but I know it's the most overlooked. Too often, we don't pay attention to who we spend our time with. The third question I would ask you today is, where are you investing your time, your talent, your treasure? Where are you investing your time, your talent, your attention, and your money? I can look at your schedule. I can look at where you spend time on your phone. And I can look at your bank account, and I can tell exactly where your heart is. 
These are the only resources you have in your life, and they're finite. Where are you spending these things? Where you focus will be your progress. Wherever you're focusing on, that will be where you have progress. So look, that means you've got to be unfun sometimes. I tell you I want to lose weight and be healthy and all that kind of stuff. You know what? I'm adverse to exercise. Not a fan. So do I get to say that to God? God, I don't like exercise, so I need you to, like, download a healthy body. Or does he say, uh, yeah, stop eating out of a garbage can and move every once in a while? Well, what if I pray real hard? You know, I grew up seeing healings my whole life. I went through a season where I would pray every single time I knelt down. I would pray, God, if you could get, if you could cure somebody from cancer, why can't you cure me from obesity? Nobody's ever prayed these prayers. Well, I'm just so glad y'all are in the house. Fix it, Lord. It's because there's a lot of things that are already in my capability to do. And just because I don't like to do them doesn't mean I get an out. That means at night, I do the best I can to tuck my boys in every single chance I get. I fail a lot. But every chance I get, I try to tuck my boys in. And before they go to bed, I try to read them a story. That's awkward. They never sit down. They're boys. They don't want to hear it. I try to pray over them. They won't shut up. And I try to tell them what kind of men we're going to be. And it's awkward. Every once in a while, it's really fun. And usually there's a Facebook post. Like twice a year, it's fun. A lot of times it's an investment, and I can't see where the seeds are coming from. I cannot see if they're going to pop through the ground. I don't know if there's a harvest coming. But i got to keep doing what I'm called to do. Because I want my boys to know that my time, my attention, and my money, where my heart is, is God first and then second. If I get to heaven and I'm given ten cities and those three boys aren't in them, what's it been for? As a young person, I used to hear parents say that and I would never understand what they meant. I couldn't understand it. I'm just as important as your kid. No. Nope. The last thing is, will you have anything to show for the faith you give? You've been given by the king. The king trusts you. He called you before him. He's called you by name, and he's called you in front of him. And he said, I'm giving you a mina. Go do business. Will you have anything to show? Will you have anything to return for your faith? With every return, there is a reward. From a mina to a city. This is the kingdom of the heart, because when you reach the hopeless with hope, You change generations. I'm thankful to God that there was a chaplain on a boat headed to the Philippines during World War II that got my grandfather's attention. My grandfather knew Jesus. He knew who Jesus was. But my grandfather's life was changed on that boat, and I thank God. And look at the cities that 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 chaplain planted into. Look at the kingdoms that are being built. One day of faith can change destinies, generations, cities can be changed because one group of people decided to believe in a king who is good and righteous. So where's the return on your faith? These four questions, I don't know if you're picking it up or not, but basically, who you worship, you connect with, where you grow, and who you lead tells you exactly who your master is. Who actually is your God? Who are the people around you, and are they going to build you into a better person? What are the things that you have to grow and, and, and steward correctly? You've been given one life to steward Are you stewarding it right? So here's what I want. With all of my insecurities I talked about at the beginning of this message, 
Here's what I want now. I want to pray and to preach and to lead and to love and to live like Jesus called me to do. And you know what I want for each one of you? I don't want you to preach, love, lead. I don't want you to do like me. I want you with all of your insecurities, with all of your past, with all your failures, I want you to preach and to pray and to lead and to love and to live the way Jesus has called you to do. I need you to do it out loud and as loud as you possibly can because the time is coming. He is coming back. The King is coming back. And if we are not faithful right now, because that's what He calls us, He doesn't say, well done, good and successful servant. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. Which one is faithful? Number one, faith is believing in Him. Number two, it's always doing what he's told us to do thank you for joining the askville assembly of god sermon podcast for more information on our ministry please visit our website at askvilleassembly.com